Okay, so good morning everyone. Today you are going to present three different topics uh, about three different things your colleagues here chose. We, I hope we'll have fun with it. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about carry malformation, as they are uh, relatively uh, common congenital malformations. We are going to uh, talk about carry one, two, and three, because there are other uh, categories and subcategories. Uh, in carry one, simply there's uh, tonsillar herniation, and in carry two, there's uh, tonsillar and brain herniation plus uh, myelomeningocele. Uh, carry 3, uh, there will be uh, features of carry 2 plus uh, encephalocele. So put these pictures in your mind and you will proceed. Uh, let's start with uh, carry 1 malformation. It is the commonest type. It occurs in 1 in 1,000 births. It is more common in female. All three types are more common in female. Uh, the presence of uh, symptoms is proportional to the degree of the descent. But it's not always uh, the case. Uh, I mean, uh, there may be a large uh, tonsillar descent and there's a mild symptom with a small descent and severe symptoms. And uh, we should uh, know that not any herniation is scary. That is uh, to say it is by de definition more than five millimeter and or pointed. Uh, pointing is important uh, as it is uh, determines the degree of the compressibility. The more it is pointed, the more it is compressed. Uh, it can be associated with syrinx and uh, hydrocephalus with uh, skeletal anomalies like basilar uh, invagination and uh, uh, platybasia. Uh, how syrinx is formed uh, within the spinal canal, you know there's a central spinal canal. Once it is uh, obstructed, compressed at the foramen magnum, it will uh, form a cyst-like structure within the cord. Uh, called uh, syrinx. It occurs in 40% of uh, those with Chiari 1. 90% uh, of this 40% are symptomatic. <coughs> <coughs> the X-ray findings, you may find uh, loss of cervical lordosis with uh, uh, exaggerated uh, thoracic kyphosis, more than 40 degree. And uh, suspect syrinx if uh, the cervical spinal canal is enlarged. What you'll find on CT scan, uh, you'll uh, find small uh, uh, posterior uh, bony, uh, po bony posterior fossa and low uh, t tentorial circular insertion, uh, effaced posterior fossa cisternis, uh, of course crowded foramen magnum, and uh, with the lateral and third ventricle are usually normal in 89% of cases. What you'll find on MRI, which is, uh, MRI is uh, mid sagittal MRI is used for uh, the diagnosis. Uh, on T1, you'll uh, see a uh, uh, pointed triangular shaped peg like tonsil. Can you show us on this image? Uh, yes, but I, oh, pointer is work. Yeah. Yes, yes. Sorry. Uh, here is the tonsil, how it is herniated three, uh, any, more than five millimeter below the foramen magnum. Uh, the sura uh, surrounding CSF in the posterior fossa will be effaced. And uh, you will find short clevis uh, that causes apparent descent of the fourth uh, ventricle and the medulla. Uh, these are different uh, degrees of tonsillar herniation. Here it's five millimeter. Uh, this is 12 to 15 and 25 to 35, uh, 30 millimeter degree herniation. Uh, on T2 weighted scan, you will look, uh, look for any uh, upper cervical core edema, uh, which indicates comp uh, compression, and look for any syrinx of present. Uh, here in this case, uh, there's abnormal signal intensity within the cord, but in this case there's another finding which is uh, commonly associated with Chiari, which is uh, posterior split of the uh, bulbous uh, odontoid tip that causes more compression to the cord and uh, plus the tonsillar herniation here in this case you will see uh, compressive myelopathy within the upper cervical cord. So the odontoid process goes posteriorly, <coughs> yes. but compressing on the spinal cord that is already <coughs> compressed. Okay. 
compressed by the cerebellar so there will be more compression mm. uh, and uh, in this uh, axial CT uh, axial MRI you will see how the tonsil is uh, compressing and surrounding the cord mm -hmm. uh, here is unilateral tonsillar herniation and it can be unilateral Uh, I want to give you a few talk about uh, CINI MRI. It is the second step after uh, diagnosing uh, Chiari 1 uh, on the uh, routine MRI. It's again uh, using routine MRI, but uh, plus a finger clip or a chest strap uh, to monitor the heartbeat. Uh, normally, with each uh, cardiac cycle, you will uh, have a CSF um, forces up and down the brain stem. Uh, <coughs> Uh, in this uh, MRI sequence, this CSF flow will be determined uh, mm -hmm. and uh, multiple images will be uh, obtained. Uh, they are collected to form a short movie uh, that's useful to determine whether the CSF is obstructed or not obstructed. Here in this example, you have uh, normal flow. <coughs> As you see, there's flow anterior and posterior to the brainstem. Here is an example of five millimeter tonsillar ectopia. You can see the CSF uh, flow anteriorly, but not posteriorly. It means uh, partial obstruction to CSF. In this example, we have eight millimeter tonsillar ectopia. You can see the flow <coughs> anteriorly and not posteriorly. Sorry, the previous slide was normal, good flow. Uh, there is some flow again posteriorly. But in the 11 millimeter, there's flow anteriorly, but no posteriorly. It means partial obstruction. <coughs> Here in this example, we have associated basilar invagination. We, in previous slides, we said basilar invagination is uh, when there's uh, short cleavage, the upper part of the odontoid will be above the foramen magnum. Uh, so uh, in this uh, example, we have complete obstruction to CSF. You will. Uh, seen uh, no flow, neither anterior nor posterior. Uh, the differential diagnosis for Chiari 1 will be basilar invagination, uh, pulling from below by LP or LP shunt, or pushing from above by chronic VP shunt or a mass effect. Uh, so uh, now uh, we should uh, our job yeah, to determine uh, how much is the how much the tonsil is herniated. Second uh, is the cord is uh, compressed or not, uh, and the CSF flow. Uh, and the surgeon will decide whether this patient needs surgery or not. Uh, the surgery will be removal of part of the occipital bone with the optional removal of uh, posterior arch of C1. Uh, and uh, they will open the dura. They will put a dural patch over it to uh, provide more space to the CSF and how to evaluate it on MRI. Here in this example, it is uh, before surgery. You will see com uh, occipital bone is completely seen with the posterior arch of C1. Uh, after surgery, uh, you cannot see uh, part of the occipital bone is removed, and the posterior arch of C1 is also removed. Uh, and uh, the, how the tonsil, uh, tonsil is uh, become uh, rounding in shape again, uh, and the CSF is seen posterior to the cere cerebellum, which was not seen before surgery. This is another example, 10 millimeter Chiari with syrinx. Uh, again, uh, the tonsil reshaped back to its normal shape, round shape, and the syrinx is uh, remarkab remarkably uh, reduced in size after surgery, two years after surgery. Now, uh, Chiari to malformation. It is a complex malformation of hindbrain and 100% association with the neural tube defect. Simply, Chiari 2 is uh, to, uh, cerebellar herniation, which is seen as a, a cascade of tissue behind the medulla, plus the brainstem herniation. Uh, here uh, we have also medullary herniation, and the compression of the pons and the cranial nerves, and the fourth ventricle will be elongated. Here, in the tectum will be big, uh, big shaped, uh, the mass intermedia will be enlarged, and uh, the corpus callosal dysgenesis is seen in 90% of cases. Uh, on X-ray, what you will see, you may uh, find lacunar skull and up, uh, widened upper cervical canal. On myelography, you can see the tethered cord, uh, 
but this diagram I, I did it I don't know if it's wrong sorry uh, but uh, nerve root is past horizontal and if the, with a more severe degree of tethering they may pass upward even uh, non contrast enhanced CT the posterior fossa will be small uh, here is the tentorial torcular insertion will be very low and the uh, large funnel shaped foramen magnum scallop with petrous pyramid and notched clevis here it is not that clear but in others it, you can see it uh, dural abnormalities you will see hypoplastic dura and interdigitated gyri here in these two examples you will see interdigitated gyri due to hypoplastic dura here it is more clear uh, interdigitated gyri is seen uh, in the posterior interhemispheric fissure associated with multiple uh, gray matter heterotopia here it is and uh, heart shaped incisura heart, you, here you can see heart shaped tectum with the abnormal position of folia and this plastic cerebellum uh, this uh, picture we will discuss in other slides and you can see absent fax cerebelli on MRI on T1 you will see again small posterior fossa the pons and cra uh, cranial nerves will elongate and uh, the fourth ventricle become elongated uh, the tonsils wrap around the medulla you, you saw it before the cerebellum protrudes up the score towering of the cerebellum due to a uh, herniation of the cerebellum through uh, dehiscent uh, incisural levers. <coughs> On T2-weighted image, the ventricles, the lateral ventricles will uh, have a pointed anterior horn with cold postcephaly, uh, that's say the dilatation of the occipital hornets of the lateral ventricles. Well, uh, and you can see here a uh, large mass intermedia uh, and it will be high riding if uh, the corpus callosum is uh, dysgenetic. Uh, the fourth ventricle will be elongated, straw like, without posterior pointing, that's to say the fastigium will be absent. And uh, small fossa, concave uh, clevis, here it is a bit clearer, you can see how the clevis is concave, and the temporal bones also will become concave. Low lying uh, again to, to, uh, tentorial torcular insert, uh, obliterated basal cisternes, and uh, cascade uh, or waterfall of tissue down behind the medulla. Here it is. This is the fetal MRI indicated intrauterine diagnosis of Chiari 2. You can see the uh, hydrocephalus with interruption of the skin and the uh, cord uh, at this level. Uh, on MRV, you can see torcular transverse sinuses are extremely low. On MRI of the spine, you can see open dysraphism. Myelomeningeal so almost 100% will be present. Uh, and it's uh, most commonly seen in the lumbar area, then thoracic and cervical. Ha again, syrinx uh, might be present in 20 to 90% of cases. The posterior arch of C1 anomaly in 66 percent and the estimate mainly in 5% of cases. On ultrasound, you can see the well-known lemon and banana sign. Uh, here it is the banana sign and the lemon sign. Uh, differential diagnosis will be severe, chronic, shunted congenital hydrocephalus. Uh, now, Chiari 3 malformation. Uh, this is uh, presence of the Chiari 2 malformation inside the brain plus uh, high cervical and occipital meningoencephalus. On non-contrast enhanced CT, you will see occipital squamous defect. Here uh, there is a 3D reconstruction of the CT scan. You can see the defect in the occipital bone with the upper cervical area. And it, uh, features of Chiari 2 will be seen uh, here all features are present, uh, the tectal uh, beaking and the lo uh, low cerebellum syrinx is seen, and the cerebellum is herniated through the uh, defect. On MRI, on T1, you will look for the sac contact. Uh, it may contain meninges, cerebellum, plus minus the brainstem, cisternus, uh, the fourth ventricle, dural sinuses, <coughs> in 50% may be present within the sac. And again, hydrocephalus, sometimes the ventricles might be totally absent. 
and uh, the KRE2 features we, uh, we talked about them. On T2-weighted image, you can see the tissues in the sac may be bright due to gliosis. The differential diagnosis uh, will be isolated occipital encephalocyte, but in this example, you cannot see the KRE2 features. In encephaly and syndromic occipital encephalocyte, like Michael Gruber and Dan DeWalker, mark formation. And thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much. Any questions? Okay. So now <coughs> Dr. Bilana will present us something about some new research. Oh, Today, uh, I will talk about a research on, uh, that uh, has been published in 2011 in the um, uh, Radiology Society of North uh, America Journal, uh, which is about thyroid imaging, uh, reporting, and data system for ultrasound features of, thi uh, of thyroid nodules. Um, uh, this is a step in establishing a better stratification of uh, cancer risk. Uh, the widespread use of ultrasonography has been contributed to increase the detection of thyroid nodules. Thyroid ultrasound depicts nodule in up to 67% uh, of population. However, um, only less than 10% of these nodules are malignant. Although many reports have dem uh, demonstrated malignant <coughs> ultrasound features that uh, necessitate uh, ultrasound guide uh, fine needle aspiration biopsy, it is still difficult um, to decide which uh, lesions should undergo FNA. The purpose of uh, this study is to develop a practical thyroid imaging reporting and data system uh, with which to categorize thyroid nodules and uh, stratify their malignant risk. Uh, materials and methods, um, from May to December 2008, uh, uh, ultrasound guide FNA was performed in uh, 3,674 uh, focal thyroid nodules in uh, 3,414 uh, patients. Nodules that are included in this study um, uh, was uh, measuring um, at least one centimeter in their maximum diameter. Of uh, those uh, nodules uh, uh, on which FNA uh, done, uh, only um, 1,972 nodules met the size criteria. For the nodule to be included in this study um, should be uh, on the cytology um, had benign or malignant result, or the nodule uh, should uh, yeah, uh, underwent thyroid surgery after the specimen uh, from <coughs> cytological examination were classified as suspicious for thyroid carcinoma or it was indeterminate or inadequate. <coughs> so those nodules are included in the study. So they did FNA from several thousand nodules. Yes. The ones that are more than one centimeter included. Included. The ones that are so diagnosed as malignant included. And the ones that are surgically removed are included. Included. Oh. Uh, among uh, the uh, 1,972 nodules that are examined, uh, uh, 314 were excluded as they were suspicious for papillary carcinoma, eight of them, or indeterminate, eight of them, or uh, had inadequate result, 298 of them, but did not undergo uh, surgery. So this study included 1,658 uh, 1, thyroid nodules in 1,638 uh, patients. A univariant and multivariant analysis with generalized estimating equation were performed to investigate the relationship between the suspicious ultrasound features and the thyroid cancer. And a score for each feature uh, is assigned and multiplied by B coefficient obtained for each significant factor. A score for each significant factor then added together, <coughs> uh, resulting in an equation that fitted the probability of malignancy in thyroid nodule. 
The authors evaluated the fated probability by using a regression equation. The risk of malignancy was determined according to the number of the suspicious ultrasound features. So, as the result of this study, as we say, 314 nodules excluded, uh, 1,658 nodules included. Uh, among uh, these 275 nodules were malignant. Uh, those uh, which are uh, malignant, uh, 238 nodules confirmed by surgery, uh, 37 nodules confirmed by cytology, and uh, 1,383 nodules were benign, uh, 16 nodules confirmed by surgery, and 1,323 uh, nodules confirmed by cytology. So the ultrasound features that show a significant association with malignancy were... So this is the most important part yeah. in the research. What are the features, <coughs> suspicion for pregnancy, and that should be re referred for FRA or <coughs> surgical excision? These include solid component, hypoechogenicity, marked hypoechogenicity, <coughs> microlobulated or irregular margins, microcalcification, <coughs> taller than white, or in shape. As the number of the suspicious ultrasound features increased, <coughs> the fitted probability and the risk of the malignancy also increased. As a conclusion, the risk stratification of thyroid malignancy by using the number of suspicious ultrasound features allow for the practical and convenient thyroids. Which is uh, like, like uh, similar to myrads, but similar to myrads. Similar to myrads, yes. Uh, I uh, uh, like to mention some description of some features uh, that are used in this uh, classification from American College of Radiology 2017 uh, regarding the composition of the nodules. Uh, and uh, for each feature, a point will be given, um, uh, and there's an online calculator can be used, uh, just uh, uh, marking the features, and at the end, it will give you the uh, tyrants. Uh, regarding the composition, it uh, could be either cystic with, uh, com or yeah, almost completely cystic. No point will be collected. Uh, mix solid and cystic, uh, one point. Uh, solid or almost completely solid, two points. A spongy form in which more than 50% um, uh, of the nodule <coughs> is composed of small cystic um, uh, spaces, zero point. Um, regarding ecogenic uh, foci, large uh, comital artifact indicates benign um, uh, nodule, zero point. <coughs> uh, it is a deeper echo attenuated with a decrease with resulting in the triangular shape, uh, usually V-shape more than uh, one millimeter in a cystic component. Uh, macro calcification, one point with posterior acoustic shadowing. A peripheral uh, rim calcification, uh, this could be either regular or interrupted. When it's regular, it's usually more in the benign nodules, while when, there is, uh, yeah, when it's interrupted, uh, it uh, may be associated with malignant nodular papillary or follicular carcinoma, two points. A punctate ecogenic um, uh, foci, this micro calcification, less than one millimeter, highly suspicious feature, three points will be collected, it's less than one millimeter. Regarding ecogenicity, as we said, cystic, anechoic, cystic, no point. Uh, Hyperechoic or isoechoic uh, in the relation to the thyroid tissue, one point. Uh, Hypoechogenicity, uh, also in the relative to the in the relation to the thyroid tissue, two points. Uh, when it is very hypoechoic, uh, it means more hypoechoic than the neck musculature, strap muscle, nearly similar ecogenicity to the uh, surrounding vessels. <coughs> this is highly suspicious, three points. Regarding the margin of the nodule, uh, when there is extrathyroidal uh, extension, this is uh, highly suspicious, three points. <coughs> when there is obvious invasion to the surrounding, this indicates malignancy, as in this image. Uh, Ill-defined uh, margin or uh, indeterminate, zero point. Uh, when it's lobulated or irregular margin, could be spiculated, jagged or uh, sharp angle, two points. Uh, 
or lobulated when it is smooth zero point usually in the benign lesions regarding the shape when it is wider than taller zero points will be collected while when it is uh, taller than wider in which the AP diameter ratio to the transverse diameter is more than one and this is highly suspicious three points will be collected uh, at the end these points will be collected and if the sum of the points uh, were zero this means TR1 the lesion is the uh, nodule is benign no FNA is required if the uh, points that are collected were two points this is TR2 uh, non-suspicious and uh, also no FNA required if the uh, three points collected this is TR3 mildly suspicious nodule if the lesion was or nodule more than 2.5 cm, FNA should be done. If it is less uh, um, uh, than uh, one, less than 2.5, between 2.5 and 1.5, follow up. Um, if uh, four to six points collected, TR4 moderately suspicious, uh, FNA should be done if the lesion is uh, equal or more than <coughs> 1.5 cm, and uh, follow up if it is more than 1 cm. Uh, if more than seven points uh, collected, uh, this is TR5, uh, highly suspicious. Uh, FNA should be done if the lesion is more than 1 cm. And uh, follow up if it is less than uh, 0.5 uh, cm. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. So I think this we should put to decrease the number of the unnecessary FNAs that we do like every now and then. Hmm? Yep. One or two, Dr. One Good morning, colleagues. We have started our journey from the brain down to the thyroid, and now I will shift you more down to the knee joint. Today, I would like to a little bit change the presentation, so please, anyone can pick up the sign. Yes. What, What's the what sign? is the sign? Anybody has any idea? Maybe this is more clear. <laughs> so, this is a frontal x ray of the knee joint uh, showing the distal femur, tibia, and fibula. Just a second. I think yes. Okay, thank you. So this is a frontal x-ray of the knee joint showing the distal femur, tibia, and fibula. Here we can see 
a linear small bone fragment. It is an avulsion fracture <coughs> of the lateral tibial plateau. <coughs> so, our sign today is called the second sign fracture. First described by Paul Ferdinand II, French surgeon, and it was based on a cadaver experiment. As a definition, is an avulsion fracture of the knee that involves the lateral aspect of the tibial plateau, very frequently associated with disruption of the ACL, and on the frontal knee radiograph, it may be referred to as the lateral capsular sign. As a clinical presentation, the, mainly the patient will experience an internal rotation with various stress, so it will twist and, and it will have a stress injury here and it typically occurs due to fall or sport, especially skiing, basketball, and baseball. As an anatomical review, this is, let's say, a sagittal plane. This is the iliotibial band, and this here, it will occur the second fracture. As a radiology, the classical appearance of a second <coughs> fracture is that of a curvilinear or elliptic bone fragment projected parallel to the lateral aspect of the tibial plateau. This has been referred to as the lateral capsular sign, which is best seen on the AP view of the knee. MRI is essential in all cases of second sign fracture to identify internal damage. Associated with injury is mostly ACL, about 75 to 100%, or medial or lateral meniscal tear will also be seen. This is a coronal T1 weighted image. Here, I think the fracture, the evulsion is very clear. And this is the stair showing edematous bone injury. And here, the disruption of the ACL is very clear. Passing to another sign, if you don't. Okay. Yeah, please. Now, who can pick up the sign? It's very clear, this one. Sound, what? Is There's a bruise here. Bruising, bone bruising. Oh. Bone and on the... On Let the us look here side. carefully. And you have Can you see three layers here? Level. Yes, three level. Yeah. This is what? This is called the perfect sign. Perfect sign. ثاني واحد إلي لعب ما حلا. Perfect sign. Perfect is a very famous French smoothie. It is layers. It shows several layers. Here, the perfect sign here, the independent layer, this one, is the fat. Below it will be the serum, and the last one is hematoma. So. <laughs> the perfect sign has been used to describe the tri-level appearance of a lipohemoarthrosis in the knee on MRI and CT studies. The top, the undependent layer, represents floating fat that has escaped from the marrow through a cortical fracture and hence follow fat density and signal intensity on both CT and MRI. The middle layer contains serum and bottom dependent layer represents red cells. The signal intensity of these layers depend on the age of the blood product and the specific imaging sequences. On CT, the dependent layer is often the most dense. On MRI studies, a thin band representing chemical shift artifact may also be noted between the fat and serum. <coughs> and thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, Yani you are the, the steel team, not the iron, so you more than the iron team. The first thing. 